If you're here in spirit tonight, I want to get two things done for you. One is a short video showing the strategies of the armies of the Romans and what they did coming through Israel. I want you to pay attention to one particular place in it where it shows Vespasian and Titus coming in from two different places in a pincher pincher movement. The reason being is I am pretty sure that that land beast in Revelation 13 is them. They are the horns of the beast. Horns because, of course, horns always refers to war making or trouble or power. So that's coming up. And then I want to do one of my favorite parts, and that is to look at Josephus and correspond some of Josephus with a revelation. That's good. And that should take it take care of the whole time. So I'm going to get started right now for session 12. Session 12. Strategy of War. Rome's polytheistic religious practices were remarkably tolerant for the time, and throughout the centuries even incorporated many deities of their former enemies. However, the Romans always experienced problems with monotheism. The most prominent monotheistic group in the early Roman Empire were the Jews. This enduring people, motivated by their religion, would be a consistent thorn in the side of Roman leaders for centuries. One of the most infamous episodes of violence between Rome and Judaism would be the Jewish Revolt of 66 to 74 AD culminating in the capture of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Second Temple. After a rebellion against the declining Seleucid Empire, the Hasmonean dynasty came to power in Judea during 146 BC. 146 BC. In 67 BC, two brothers, Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, drove the realm into civil war. To the north, Roman general Pompey had been finishing up the Mithridatic Wars and in 63 BC thrusted south along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. Upon his arrival in Damascus, he intervened in the civil war on behalf of Hyrcanus, captured Jerusalem and eventually made Judea a client kingdom. After a brief Parthian occupation, Rome captured the city again in 37 BC and installed their client Herod as king. In 4 BC he perished and Judea became a Roman province. Imperial authority in the region leaned heavily on the local elites, but they often lacked the confidence of the wider Jewish population, resulting in near perpetual strife. Throughout the early 1st century, Jewish frustration grew and they chafed under the Roman boot. This resulted in increasingly violent actions perpetrated by sects such as the infamous Jewish Sicarii. Judea was a powder keg, a tangle of class, ethnic and religious divisions. In 66 AD, a Greek mob profaned the Caesarea synagogue, and that led to riots among the infuriated Jewish population. Meanwhile in Jerusalem, Roman procurator Gessius Florus chose this inopportune moment to collect overdue taxes. In an unwise move, he did this by plundering 17 talents of silver and gold from the treasury of the Second Temple. Reacting to this, some young and bold Jews mocked Florus by begging for spare change in the name of the apparently poverty-stricken procurator. 
infuriated, Florus executed thousands. When he moved to bring in reinforcements, the Jews began to resist. Overwhelmed by the local population, the Roman soldiers retreated to the citadel and the Great Jewish Revolt began. The members of the radical Jewish sect, Sicarii, then marched to the fortress of Masada, where they proceeded to overwhelm and massacre the 700-strong garrison. Meanwhile in Jerusalem, the soldiers who had withdrawn to the palace sued for terms but were massacred when they tried to surrender their weapons. The rival Jewish factions united, brutally capturing the fortress of Kipros and securing the surrender of Machaerus. Tensions among the disparate populations erupted as well. Greek mobs would massacre Jews in cities such as Ascalon, Caesarea and Tyre, while Jewish prowled the region and retaliated. The Roman Empire could not allow such defiance, and the proconsul of Syria, Cestius Gallus, marched south with 30,000 troops. Gallus sought to seize Jerusalem in order to restore order but the siege failed and the legions were subsequently ambushed at the Beth Horon Pass as they retreated to the coast. Lightly armed Jewish rebels, wielding javelins, slings and bows, encircled them and inflicted huge losses. Legio XII Fulminata was annihilated, the army's siege weapons were captured and the legionary Aquila Eagle Standard was lost. Gallus's punitive campaign had been a complete catastrophe and emboldened the rebels. To the west, Roman Emperor Nero received word of the revolt in Judea whilst on a concert tour of Greece. Requiring a competent general to take charge and crush the insurrection, Nero appointed a veteran of the British campaign, Titus Flavius Vespasianus, otherwise known as Vespasian, to command the army of Judea. Vespasian immediately set off for Judea, taking the overland route over the Hellespont and through the Great Cilician Gates. After reaching the city of Antioch, two legions and their associated auxiliary units joined him. And here's the horn. Vespasian marched south to Ptolemais, while his son Titus south. was sent to Alexandria in order to take command of another legion and march it north to join the main army. Meanwhile, reinforcements also arrived from the various local allies and clients. In total, the empire mustered around 60,000 troops to crush the revolt. No prisoners were taken and entire opposition villages were reduced to ash. This proved to be effective, as the 10,000-strong Jewish field army quickly scattered in all directions, seeking haven in the fortified strongpoints. In the subsequent campaign into Galilee during 67 AD, Vespasian systematically moved through the region, brutalizing any defiant settlement and often allowing his rapacious legionaries free reign to loot, burn, murder and pillage as they pleased. Critical settlements defending the region were captured. Jotapata fell to Vespasian first, followed by Joppa, Tiberius, Tarakea, and Gamala before his army was finally billeted in its winter quarters, leaving a subdued region in its wake. The fall of Galilee to Vespasian's legionaries prompted more internal strife among the Jewish factions. As the campaigning season of 68 AD began, Vespasian was in no hurry to intervene, stating that, since our enemies are busy dying by their own hands, the best course of action would be to stay as spectators instead of taking on fanatics who welcome death and are already busy murdering each other. Content to leave Jerusalem to its internal squabbling, the Roman general marched across the mountainous province of Perea and Judea proper, taking almost every settlement of note one by one, laying waste to the countryside and slaughtering tens of thousands of civilians. The campaigning season of 69 AD began similarly. Dispatching his subordinates to the peripheral regions, Vespasian marched on Jerusalem itself. 
He established garrisons in the towns that anchored his supply lines to the coast, while the Roman horsemen rode down and destroyed any remaining hostile units in the vicinity of Jerusalem. It seemed like only a miracle could save the rebels from Vespasian's wrath. They would get one very soon. Discontent with Emperor Nero's infamous excesses had been building throughout the 60s AD, and now it finally came to a head. Back in March of 68 AD, the provincial governor of Gallia Lugdunensis, Vindex, rebelled against Nero. His revolt was quickly crushed, but it set the tone for the Year of the Four Emperors, as another pretender named Galba was declared emperor and marched on Rome. Deserted by his Praetorian guard, Nero was forced to commit suicide. Galba did not last long, and a few months later he was usurped by Otho, who subsequently was dethroned by Vitellius. Spiraling defiance of imperial authority also resulted in a Batavian revolt on the Rhine River, and grain supplies to Rome from Africa being cut off. With the empire suddenly in the process of eating itself alive, the campaign into Judea came to a halt, as Vespasian paused to consider his options. Finally, on July 1st, 69 AD, Vespasian was proclaimed Caesar by the prefect of Egypt in the presence of his legions. The Flavian faction, Vespasian, his family and supporters, then held a war council where their strategy was decided. Vespasian would establish his headquarters in Egypt, while Titus, assisted by Tiberius Alexander, would conclude the campaign of subduing the Jews. Tiberius Alexander was uh, Titus began the Jerusalem Philo's campaign nephew. in spring of Sevdat Beth Horon. Many of the Jews defending the city had lost their families in the previous Roman campaigns and wanted revenge. Despite its population being swollen by refugees, water was not a problem, as Jerusalem had many cisterns and pools that could be filled with rainwater. However, food stores had been burned in the inter-Judaic strife months before, and the situation was therefore tenuous. This strife was still ongoing, even with the Romans so close, and the defending forces were split into three sub-factions. Realizing his newly arrived legions must be exhausted from the night march, Titus gave orders to construct two camps to the west of the city, one joint camp for the 12th and 15th legions at a stop three quarters of a mile west of the city walls, and another camp 600 yards further back for the 5th legion. Shortly after this, the 10th legion arrived and was ordered to encamp to the east of the city on the Mount of Olives. The looming Roman siege temporarily united the squabbling Jewish factions, and they agreed on an immediate attack against the soldiers of the 10th Legion, who were busy constructing their hilltop camp. Sallying out of the city, a detachment of rebels rushed up the slope and cut down droves of legionnaires. Encouraged by this initial success, reinforcements were sent to press the attack and they managed to drive the men of the 10th Legion from their uncompleted camp. Hearing of their plight, Titus arrived with his cavalry bodyguard and struck the Jews from the flank, driving them back into the ravine between their camp and the city walls. However, they then attacked again instead of retreating. Under this renewed assault, the Romans broke and fled to the heights, leaving their general. Ashamed, and realizing Titus had not fled, the legion regrouped, charged, and prompted the Jews to flee back to the city. The camp on the hill was subsequently finished, though now it was clear that the Jews would not meekly submit to them. Aiming to prevent this happening again, Titus posted strong contingents of horse and footmen to the east of the city to deter further sorties, and ordered that the ground between the Roman camps and the city was to be leveled. This would both deny the guerrilla fighters a favorable hiding place, and allow siege engines to advance. With this done, Titus decided on concentrating his assault on the western flank of the Third Wall, between Sephinus Tower and the Western Gate. The three legions facing this section of the wall were each ordered to construct an earth and timber ramp. 
The construction efforts were initially disrupted by sorties out of the city, but the concentration of Roman artillery, including large stone-throwing devices and quick-firing iron bolt-throwing scorpions, pinned the Jews down long enough for the works to be completed. Retaining a steady rain of missiles on the walls, Titus then ordered three battering rams to smash the western wall, which were initially unsuccessful until three siege towers were brought up to reinforce them. After a long period of pressure, on the 15th day of the siege, Roman siege engines punched a hole through the wall. With their entire force now at risk, the defenders quickly withdrew to the second wall, leaving Titus to occupy the new city. Unwilling to surrender their momentum, the legions immediately moved their rams up to the second wall, where they began to batter the tower gate. After just four days of attacks, one of the rams brought it down and made a breach. Legionaries flooded through it into the eerily silent second city. However, as they advanced, rebels sprung from ambush positions and bombarded the Romans with missile fire. Quickly forming into their tight shielded squares, the legions fought their way back to the narrow breach, where many died struggling to push through. Eventually, auxiliary archers arrived and drove the Jews away, allowing the bewildered legionaries to escape. After the Jews resisted in this area for four more days, the Romans finally broke through. This time, Titus ordered the entire northern section of the second wall torn down. The defensive front now narrowed, and the Jews were able to bring more forces to bear on their enemy. After advancing into the second city, Titus now split his legions into two army groups, which each constructed two siege ramps. The 10th and 15th legions attacked the first wall opposite the tomb of John Hyrcanus, while the 5th and 12th legions besieged the Antonia fortress, named by Herod the Great in honour of Mark Antony. The ramps were eventually completed on May 29th, followed by an all-out assault during which Titus brought up additional battering rams and siege engines to assault the Antonia fortress. They did this under constant artillery fire from bolt shooters and stone throwers, which the Jews had taken from Gallus in 66. As the assault began, Jewish sappers dug under the Roman siege lines, undermined the ramps and set fire to the tunnel. This caused the ground to collapse in on itself in a clattering roar, swallowing the Roman ramps and siege towers, which demoralized the legions, as they had spent weeks constructing these engines. To improve security, tighten the blockade and restore morale, Titus ordered that an 8 km long wall of circumvallation was to be constructed, cutting the besieged sections of Jerusalem off from the outside world. This massive undertaking was, typically, finished in only three days by the Romans, and had 13 fortresses along its circumference to strengthen it. Before it was made, the Jewish rebels were able to quite easily venture out of the city to forage for food and supplies, but this was now made impossible. Famine quickly descended on the city, and its inhabitants slowly began to starve and die. This done, Titus now focused all his efforts on conquering the Antonia fortress again. A day of assaults initially yielded no results, however the Romans had accomplished more than they had realized. The foundations of the Antonia fortress, undermined by heavy rain and the Jewish saboteur's tunnel which had destroyed the Roman siege engines, collapsed during the night. The first Romans who exploited this gap discovered to their horror that the Jews had built up a secondary wall behind the first, which was eventually overcome when a contingent of brave legionaries attacked it during a night assault. The first of several battles for the Temple Mount occurred after this, during which the Romans failed to break out onto the forecourt. In its aftermath, Titus ordered the Antonia fortress destroyed. On July 17th, the Romans attempted to seize the temple's courtyard again, but were again repulsed in close quarters fighting, during which the Jews were often wearing captured Roman equipment. This confused the combatants and made friendly fire incidents common. 
neither side was able to gain an advantage under these conditions. After the second failure, Titus ordered that four siege ramps were to be constructed and used against the northwest corner of the Temple Mount. At the same time, the Jews proved they were not beaten when a major sortie was launched against the siege wall protecting the Mount of Olives, but was repelled. The Jews also abandoned the area of the wall where the Roman siege ramps were mounted. However, they had rigged the area with a fire trap, and this killed many soldiers as they advanced, seemingly unhindered. By August 9th, withering artillery fire and Roman offensives had made the Jewish defense of the courtyard untenable, and they pulled back to the inner defenses of the temple itself. On August 10th, during the heavy fighting, a fire began in apartments near the outer court, which spread and famously set the second temple alight being spread due to the arid conditions and the flammable materials all around. With Jewish attention divided between fighting the fires which blazed through their most holy place and defending against the Romans, they were finally broken, and their entire Temple Mount was seized in an orgy of butchery and looting. With their bloodlust finally sated, the Roman soldiers proclaimed Titus Imperator, victorious general, with this done, the legions were unleashed on the lower city, burning houses, government buildings, archives, and anything else the legions could get their hands on. Clearing this area of rebels took two days, and after another short assault, Herod's palace was taken by September 7th. The slaughter during the fall of Jerusalem supposedly resulted in the death of at least hundreds of thousands of civilians, pilgrims, and soldiers. Titus returned to Rome, where his father Vespasian, now the Roman Emperor after his victory in 70 AD, granted him a triumph. The Arch of Titus was also dedicated to him, which remains to this day. While a few isolated rebel strongholds remained, notably the Sicarii Fortress of Masada, the Jewish revolt had been essentially crushed at Jerusalem. But this was not the end of Jewish resistance, and more wars would be fought between them and the Empire. New videos on Roman history are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one. Rome's polytheistic religious practices were remarkably tolerant for the time, and throughout the centuries even incorporated many deities of their former enemies. There are umpteen correspondences between the revelation and Josephus' history of the Jewish war. Many, many, many. I hope to get in nine of those right here today because I've pretty much neglected Josephus up until this point. After 11 sessions, it's about time to get to it a little more. I'm going to start. If you can pull up a Bible, go to uh, Revelation 6, 4. Revelation 6, 4. I'm going to read my translation, and you can read whatever you like there and see what the differences are, if any. We'll have several verses out of Revelation 6 before we go on. So if you want to hold that up there, that would be fine. And when the second seal was open, I heard the second animal, Zoom, animal, saying, go. They certainly wouldn't say come. 
they would say, go, because there's horses there. Erku means both come and go. And there went another horse, a red one. And the one seated on it was given a great dagger to take the peace out of the land so that one might butcher another. Looking at that word that I've translated dagger, I think the majority have sword in there. But the type of sword it is, is a two-edged sword shorter than even the short Roman sword. It's more like the sicarii or the sica uh, dagger. And dagger does play a part in the uh, chapter 13 when a dagger is used in real life to dispatch or maybe dispatch Nero. So he was given a great dagger to take the peace out of the land so that one might butcher another. So this Revelation verse 4, chapter 6, describes the opening of the second seal. Here we see that peace would be taken from the earth or the land. This phrase can also be translated as land, as it is in Young's literal translation. It makes a lot more sense if it's translated land in most places. If you think that the word gay can only have one translation, and I'm kind of feeling that way, land is probably the best. And it's a reference to the promised land, as you already guessed, the land of Israel. A good example of this is in Luke 21, 23, the Olivet Discourse in Luke's version, where Yeshua clearly spoke of Judea. Yet some translations say on the earth, and others say in the land. There's a description given by Josephus about the civil war among the Jews, which began outside of Jerusalem, but spread to Jerusalem by the time the war began in August of 66 AD. And let me mention, Josephus, uh, in his life, if you don't know much about it, he was a priest of the temple. As a very young man, he was a commissioned to be a general over Galilee and a few other places to go out there and lead troops to fight. He was also a self-proclaimed prophet. And I believe that he was a true prophet on account of some of the prophecies he shared with us that have come true. In fact, a prophecy, as you may know, saved his life when he was captured. Actually, kind of two prophecies, but one, the star prophecy from Numbers and Balaam and Balak, the prophecy about the star coming out of the land to become the king of the world. And Josephus said, this is you, Vespasian, you wait and see, wait and see. So his life was spared until, sure enough, just not very much longer after that, a year or two. Uh, Vespasian was indeed proclaimed the emperor after uh, three other, oh, what will we say, people that, generals that tried to get in there and be emperor, but they failed. They were only in for a very short time. And uh, they're left out of the Revelation account, these three, of Revelation chapter 17, where it talks about the horns and the kings and the heads and all, they are left out. So some translators call it the earth. Some say it's the land. To me, it's got to be the land. And here is what Josephus says about that insurrection. But then it must be observed that the multitude that came out of the country were at discord before the Jerusalem sedition began. Yes, they were. There were besides disorders and civil wars in every city. And all those that were quiet from the Romans turned their hands one against another. There was also a bitter contest between those that were fond of war and those that were desirous for peace. 
And primarily those two factions at the time were the uh, Sicarii and the Zealots, which were both about the same thing. And the other one for peace what were the priests. Of course, they had coordinated their own life and government to what the Romans had told them to do for a long time. At the first, this quarrelsome temper caught hold of private families who began already to stand in opposition one to another so that the seditions arose everywhere. You saw on the video how in so many of the cities, the Greeks rose against the, the Jews. And let me say, the Greeks that rose weren't necessarily Greeks. They were Greeks and Jews as well who were living the Hellenistic lifestyle. And having had the Greeks there for 300 years and the Romans for the last 100 or 150 years, a lot of the people there knew nothing else, knew nothing else but um, the Greek way of life, the Greek religion, the Greek institutions that were put in every town, like the baths and Roman and Greek baths, where everybody goes in naked, the gymnasium. And there was also, for quite a long time, it was against the law to keep the Sabbath. You had to keep the holidays of the Greeks and later the Romans. So he continues, the barbarity and iniquity of the same nation did no way differ from the Romans. Say, nay, it seemed to be a much lighter thing to be ruined by the Romans than by themselves. So they weren't very much concerned about the Romans early on. They were concer concerned about the people next door, or the people across town. Josephus was describing the events of November 67 here when he gave this summary, 67. Josephus used phrases like one against another, in opposition one to another, civil wars in every city, and barbarity. This lines up well with John's vision of people killing one another in the land. This domestic fighting was so significant that the approach of the Romans was seen as a much lighter thing. And it's like Vespasian said, uh, if let's just hold back here. We're done for a while. While they're killing each other, just let them do that less we'll have to fight later. In John's vision, he also saw a great sword or a great dagger. Numerous times, Josephus spoke of the zealots killing others with swords and cutting their throats. The Sicarii doing the same thing with the sicca, the shorter two-edged dagger that was often curved, the blade was curved a little bit. Were there beheadings? These four instances of throat cutting, that is in Wars 2, Wars 4, another in Wars 4 and Wars 5. If you want to look those up, um, 2, 3, 4, 5, you can see what was going on there at this time during a really what was a civil war. These four instances in Josephus of throat cutting took place in Galilee and Jerusalem way back in August 66 AD, in February and March 68 AD, and May of 70 AD. So they have found like a signature way to kill each other. It's case study number one, <clears throat> dealing with Revelation chapter six. And so is the next one. Go to Revelation 6, 15, and 16. These are quite general. The next time we'll get some that are a little more specific. 6, 15, <clears throat> and the rulers of the land, and those of renown, and the commanders of thousands, and the rich, and the powerful, and all slave and free, 
hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, but we're still finding things there. And they're saying to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. For the great day of his anger has arrived and who will be able to stand it? Again, of course, the, the Jews there realized that this day, the day of Yahweh had come, that they had been threatened with all these years, centuries, actually, centuries. They'd been threatened that Yahweh was going to take his protective hand away if they didn't shape up. And they didn't even when the son was executed. And they executed him. Actually, it was the Jews that executed him or saw to it. The Romans didn't care about him, whether he was dead or alive, but they did see Yahshua as a threat and also Yaakov, James. And as we read before, uh, Josephus gives some credence to the idea that the murder of James the Just, as you call, being cast off the parapet of the temple, and then beaten to death with a club after being buried. Uh, that was, uh, uh, James was loved very much by the people. Remember, he had the opportunity to play the part of the high priest and go in on Yom Kippur on behalf of the people and atone for the sins of the people. This passage then from 615 and 16 describes the sixth seal. Note how Josephus described the attempts of zealots to save themselves when they were driven out of the lower city of Jerusalem in August of 70 AD. Look, they had been able to get these Herodian fortresses like Machares and Masada and two other ones. I, I can't call them right now. But these were rock fortresses up in the mountains and, of course, the caves. We're familiar with Qumran caves, but there are all kinds of caves there that they hid out in. I read one account where the people had gone out to a cave at the top of one of these mountains down there in the Sinai, and the Romans set up a siege village underneath them in another cave. And somebody left an account there how difficult it was not to be noticed by the Romans that were right under them when they had to sneak down the mountain to get even water and that they lived in that kind of shape for uh, a year or so. And they had a real hard time keeping from being destroyed by their enemy. And finally, the Romans did leave and they were saved. So in some very real ways, the mountains and the rocks had saved them because they're hidden in the rocks. Let them fall upon us. So the zealots themselves, they go down to Masada. They've got themselves a very good place with battlements and with weapons and all those things that Herod had put up there to save himself. Well, they got that one and at least two others. So now... The last hope which supported the tyrants, speaking of the zealots, and that crew of robbers, lestai, whatever Josephus uses the word lestai, which means robbers or bandits, he's talking about insurrectionists, or as we might say, so-called freedom fighters, insurrectionists, lestai, who were with them, was in the caves and caverns underground, whether if they could once flee, they didn't expect to be searched for, but endeavored that after the whole city should be destroyed, 
and the Romans gone away, they might come out again and escape from them. This was no better than a dream of theirs, for they were not able to hide, to lie hid, either from God or from the Romans. So John saw a vision common to this of commanders and other people hiding in the caves and rocks and attempting to hide from Elohim. Josephus likewise described the zealots as heading to the caves and caverns as their last hope, and second, being unable to hide from Elohim and the Romans. Hey, they all knew this was the fated day of Yahweh. It had come, finally. They would hide themselves from Elohim because they knew Elohim was not going to do a pea-picking thing for them. Nothing. They had their chance. That doesn't keep us from being feeling very sorry. Even though this happened a long time ago, when we get into studies like this, we begin to feel for both sides. And we get mostly what happened to the zealots and the people inside Jerusalem, but the accounts of the Romans were just about as bad. These accounts are also parallel to an earlier prophecy given by Yeshua on his way to Golgotha. And we find that in Luke chapter 23, verse 27. This is from the ISR. And a great number of the people were following him and women who also were mourning and lamenting him those two words are used over and over in Revelation. But Yahshua, turning to them, said, Daughters of Yerushalayim, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For look, days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they shall begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. But we have a lot of people today that are presuming that Josephus wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. I'm sure that you've heard some of that scuttlebutt. And there are so many um, similarities between the way they talk and the words they use that it's no wonder people are wondering about that. But Yahshua told those ladies that they and their children would personally, personally see the day when people in Jerusalem would call upon the mountains to fall on them and hide them. And remember, in the beginning of the Revelation, we have Yahshua saying at least three times, I can think of, that he's coming quickly. He's coming soon. And also in Paul, he's saying, you don't have time to get married. You don't have time to go about changing. Right now, it's just about to happen. And Paul only writes 10 or 15 years before it did happen. And if he, if Paul did live till 68 AD, for me, I have no doubt that he was involved in this in a very high position as a messenger between kings and emperors. And then about 40 years later from Yahshua, it happened just as he said, and just as John foretold, and just as Josephus recorded it. And I should say maybe the Old Testament and too, like Hosea chapter 10, 8. And the high places of Awen, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle come up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Hosea 10, 8. Case study number three. We go to Revelation chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. <clears throat> 
Revelation 8, 7 through 9, and I'll get a little drink. <clears throat> Verse 7, and the first salpingi blasted, the first trumpet blasted. These are silver trumpets, not shofars. And down came hail and fire mixed in blood, and it was cast unto the land, and the third of the land was burned up, and the third of the trees were burned up, and all green grasses were burned up, and the second messenger blasted. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood. And the third of the creatures in the sea, those having life, died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Unless we know the story behind this, we find it very difficult to believe these things. That is, again, until we study some of the historian Josephus' words on these things. And I don't think that he is guilty of exaggerating all that much. I really think that what he said is a fact. This passage here describes the first and second trumpet judgments, of course. Notice that both judgments feature a mixture of fire and blood. Compare this with Josephus, what he said happening in Galilee in March or April 67 A.D., after he tried to fortify the city of Sepphoris, which was the capital of Galilee at this time, you'll notice it's never mentioned in the New Testament, though it is the big uh, modern capital three miles from Nazareth. Never mentioned. Nazareth was a bedroom community for Jews working on fortifying the city a Sepphoris right up the road. I wouldn't doubt if Yahshua and his brothers didn't walk up that road every day to go to work. There's a great theater that's still there on that space. If you've been to Israel, certainly you've been to Sepphoris and you've been seated in this amphitheater. And there, exactly the time that Yahshua was a teenager, they were building that thing and they were rehearsing in there and they had plays going on. And remember when Yahshua said to the Pharisees, you hypocrites, the word that's actually in there is actors. Hypocrites means in Greek actors. But the translators just gave us a word that is phonetically the same but means something different in hypocrites, but are actors hypocrites? So this is in 67. This is going on in the city of Sephorus, the largest and capital city of Galilee. Wars 3 tells about that. And we'll do a little bit of a quote from Wars 3. By this means, he, that is Josephus, he's talking about himself, provoked the Romans to treat the country according to the law of war. Nor did the Romans, out of the anger they bore at this attempt, to leave off, either by night or by day, burning the places in the plain, stealing away the cattle that were in the country, killing whatsoever appeared capable of fighting perpetually, and leading the weaker people as slaves into captivity, so that Galilee was all overfilled with fire and blood. Nor was it exempted from any kind of misery and calamity. Two more words that are used in the Revelation quite often. So fire and blood, it seems to me to be a strange mixture of words, yet our revelator, he uses them too many times especially here in Revelation 8, 7 through 9. So I'm going to show you where this um, Sepphoris 
was, if I can get you to look at this map real quick. This just gives you a good idea. Everybody knows where this little horn is, Mount Carmel. Right down here is uh, Armageddon. Here's Nazareth. They didn't even put it on this map, but in the time of Yahshua, it was called Zippery. Zippery. And you can see how that would be transliterated to Sephiroth right here in this big red blotch right between Mount Carmel and the Sea of Galilee. And this is a remarkably short distance between the two and the border of Israel. That's all I got on that map because just to see where that was is in the very middle of Israel and it's still there today. And uh, let's go see it. What do you say? Let's go. Marcel, if you're still here, perhaps you could be the tour guide. It would be great. Then in uh, uh, the next one is War, Wars 393. Josephus describes what happened on the Sea of Galilee in 67 AD, June, to thousands of Jews who tried to escape from Joppa. And this is the saddest story probably of them all, except maybe the woman named Mary that ate her child. Now, as those people of Joppa were floating about in this sea in the morning, there fell a violent wind upon them. It's called by those that sail there, the Black North Wind. And there dashed their ships one against another and dashed some of them against the rocks and carried many of them by force. While they strove against the opposite waves into the main sea, for the shore was so rocky and has so many of the enemy upon it that they were afraid to come to land. And much lamentation there was when the ships were dashed against one another, and terrible noise when they were broken to pieces, and some of the multitude that were in them were covered with waves and so perished, and a great many were embarrassed with shipwrecks. But some of them thought that to die by their own swords was lighter than by the sea. And so they killed themselves before they were drowned. Although the greatest part of them were carried by the waves and dashed to pieces against the abrupt parts of the rocks, insomuch that the sea was bloody a long way. And the maritime parts were full of dead bodies. For the Romans came upon those that were carried to the shore and destroyed them. And the number of the bodies that were thus thrown out of the sea were 4,200. And I was translating Revelation 18 today. Yeah, I'm clear up to 18 now. I only got a few more chapters to go. And that also talks about these ships and what, what was being carried on those ships and all the different kinds of goods and what Babylon had to do about that and how these Merchants on the ships were embarrassed. The same word was used. It seems to me if your ship was wrecked and you were in such a great commotion as that, you'd be more than just embarrassed. But it says a great many were embarrassed with shipwrecks. All right. Then a little later in War 3109, Josephus also described what happened on the Sea of Galilee in August of 67 to people from Tiberias and Turkii. Sometimes the Romans leaped into their ships with swords in their hand and slew them. But when some of them met the vessels, 
the Romans caught them by the middle and destroyed at once their ships and themselves who were taken in them. And for such as were drowning in the sea, if they lifted their heads up above the water, they were either killed by darts or caught by the vessels. But if in the desperate case they were in, they attempted to swim to their enemies, the Romans cut off either their heads or their hands. One might then see the lake all bloody and full of dead bodies, where not one of them escaped. And a terrible stink and a very sad sight there was on the following days over that country, for as for the shores, they were full of shipwrecks and of dead bodies all swelled up. And as the dead bodies were inflamed by the sun and putrefied, they corrupted the air as well. So John sees fire and blood, land being burned, and ships being destroyed, and Josephus describes those the very things taking place throughout Galilee from March through August 67. And uh, there's more about the ships there and what was going on there in both the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea, and it's just horrible. I want you to feel this is horrible. I mean, have you ever considered the possibility of somebody coming up behind you and putting a shiv in your lungs? Putting a dagger in your lungs? I've experienced something very similar when as a young kid, I went through a glass door and the glass broke and a sword-like piece stuck in me. And before I fell forward, I grabbed that thing with both hands and pulled it out. Or I would have certainly died then because it's, it scraped along within a quarter of an inch of my heart. And I'll never forget what that felt like because I had to wait a while to get to the emergency room. And the pain of it is just like it happened yesterday. I remember laying in that room on a gurney there. I could not breathe. I was bleeding all over everything. It was horrible, pain-wise. I thought, what if you just laid here? How long would it take before you were gone or you bled out? And how horrid would the pain be by then? Case study number four is Revelation 9. If you turn there to verse 13, 13 through 16. And there's some translation errors in here, big, big translation errors. Verse 13, and the sixth messenger trumpeted. And I heard a voice out of the horns of the golden altar before Elohim, saying to the sixth angel, that should say messenger, the one having the trumpet. Hold on a minute. Maybe I can fix that. Yeah, change the color of it. I'm not using angel. I'm using messenger. Messenger, I think, gives you a truer idea of what these things might be like. And I'm not using a gender with them. They are its. So many decisions to make if you're going to translate something. Because there's so many so many opportunities to make changes. Saying to the sixth messenger, the one having the trumpet, loose the four messengers, the ones bound upon the great river. And they released the four messengers, the ones reserved for the hour and day and month and year, so as to kill one third of the people. And the number of troops of the horsemen was Two times ten thousand thousands. I heard the number of them. Uh, that uh, some Bibles I remember that saying two hundred million. Right. Well, my friends, there are no numbers there at all. There are the words uh, dismiriades and myriades, which means double myriads. And myriads, those aren't, they're not number, numbers. So to set that at 200 million 
or 200,000 is just not what he's saying because myriads are not a set number and they're not supposed to be. Lots and lots of them, but 200 million? This is something I didn't know until this study this time. Anyway, this is a partial description of the sixth trumpet. In a moment, we're going to take a look at a quote from Josephus about four commanders who led a murderous army. But first, here's some background. During the winter of 67 to 68 AD, Ananus II, you remember about him, the youngest son of Annas from the Bible, the high priest at the time that Yahshua was forming. Ananus was the former high priest in Jerusalem. He's the one that had James the Just murdered. And remember, the new governor took him out of the priesthood entirely because of doing that without a permission. It says, Ananus II urged the people of Jerusalem to oppose the lawless Jewish zealots who had taken over the temple. As blood-shedding villains, lest I. John of Giscala, some call him John Levy of Giscala, he was uh, the sociopath that somehow turned out to be the leader of the Israel zealots. John of Giscala had recently come to Jerusalem and he pretended to be on the side of Ananus. What I tell you about the priest, even though Ananus was not a very good guy, he was on the side of terms, making terms with Romans because he was smart enough and educated enough to know that there's no way in the world without a superb miracle that Israel could win that. And besides, he knew all about the day of Yahweh. And he probably had those scriptures all memorized in his youth because his whole family were high priests. Remember, Annas had five sons, actually four sons and a son-in-law. They all became high priests. All right, so John of Giscalus pretends to be on Anana's side. It's talking to these Romans. And so he was invited to be an ambassador to the Zealots. However, John quickly betrayed Ananus and falsely claimed that he had invited the Roman general Vespasian to conquer Jerusalem. In response, the Zealot leaders... Here's a couple more of them, Eliezer ben Shimon and Zacharias ben Phalek requested help from the Idumeans. You might remember me speaking of these a couple times before. And Idumea is down in the desert south of Judea, Benjamin and beyond. They told the Idumeans that Unless they would come immediately to their assistance, the city would be in the power of the Romans. Now, the Idumeans didn't like the Jews at all, but they hated the Romans. So the Idumeans quickly prepared an army of 20,000, directed by four commanders. And here's what it says about them in Wars 4, Book 4, Chapter 4, Verse 2. Now, these Idumean rulers were greatly surprised at the contents of the letter and at what those that came with it further told them, whereupon they ran about the nation like madmen and made proclamation that the people should come to war. So a multitude was suddenly gotten together, sooner indeed than the time appointed in the proclamation, and everybody caught up their arms in order to maintain the liberty of their metropolis. And 20,000 of them were put into battle array and came to Jerusalem under four commanders, Yochanan, Yaakov, son of Sosa, and besides these were Shimon, son of Cathalus, and Pincus, son of Clusophus. 
those guys will be on the test. So what about this discrepancy between the numbers 200 million and 20,000? So many times in my life, I would read in these false prophets books that coming across the Euphrates whenever it dried up, by the way, it dries up every year, we're going to be Chinese people, 200 million Chinamen are going to come across there to go to the Valley of Megiddo and fight it out with Israel or somebody, or angels or something. And I always thought, how how can that be? That's Even as a kid, I thought that was ridiculous. Earlier, I quoted uh, New King James Version about this. Like most version, it gives some variation of that 200 million. It'd be great to get a parallel Bible and take a look and see how many different things it says. But Young's literal translation, and of course mine, says two myriads of myriads. The interlinear translates this verse as twice 10,000 10, thousands. Which interlinear? I don't know, just the one I use. The word myriad in Greek supposedly means 10,000, though I can't find that any place. So two myriads was 20,000. I'm assuming that that's true. And if it is, that should be 20,000 instead of 200 million. And that's exactly how many that Josephus says was there, were there coming up from Idumea. Say, is Idumea like Iraq? Yeah, they're both desert. They're both desert. Hmm. By the way, that Euphrates River, which I did mention it dries up every year. I think it's dried up right now. And I see on YouTube uh, channel different ones that say, uh, oh, the Euphrates is just about ready to dry up. And they show, you know, a couple of fishermen down there and the water's dry in a picture, probably taken uh, two, 200 million years ago. But right across the Euphrates, the Romans had big old camps. See, the Romans, if you join the legions and you could stay in 16 years, without getting killed, or it was later changed to 20 years. If you had 20 years service, imagine that, 20 years. Well, you were, were to receive land. You were to receive an arid parcel of land somewhere in the empire. Well, I guess a lot of those guys did indeed survive 20 years in the legion and the problem was the good land was all gone by this time so they began to send retirees and their families over there just on the other side of the euphrates river in iraq which they were, they're free to go back there, you know, for quite some time, they had parcels of land back there. And so I used to think, and maybe I still do think, that this is a, could also be referring to these veterans, because there's a few times in these wars that they had to call these guys back up, these old guys, these guys over 38. They had to call them up into service and even here i've read about them calling up these old guys and their sons to come over the euphrates and get down here the war with parthia there are several wars with parthia just before this war here for jerusalem so i'm thinking uh, are these retired troops here well, maybe. I just don't think that you can stretch this as far as 200 million Chinese. Do you, Trelly? Oh, it's a little far. 
There's a similar expression used in Psalm 68, 17. The chariots of Elohim are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. Yahweh is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. This verse is far more often translated to say 20,000, the same wording, than Revelation 9, 16 is 200 million. So the interlinear for Psalm 68, 17 translates the verse to say, even thousand, 20,000 of Elohim are the chariots. When it comes to Revelation 9, 16, it seems that most translations have unnecessarily squared the number. Remember, the, the first Greek word was, what was it? I forgot. Myriads, yes. Dia, oh, here it is, was dis, dismeridias, 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 dis means two. So they're thinking that this is a meridian squared. And they're thinking that a meridian, a, a myriad, sorry, a myriad is like 10,000. But anyway, if this is true, we've got the same number that Josephus assigned to the Idumean army. And boy, was this ever a terrible idea. I don't know if I've got the rest of the story here. But I can just tell you right I've said this before, but these guys that came up to Jerusalem to help out against the Romans and to fortify Jerusalem from the desert, once they got up there, remember, they wouldn't let them in. I had read someplace that the giant door 80 feet high wouldn't come open. And they were outside trying to get in. And this is when the hur a hurricane and an earthquake came this night and a terrible storm. Maybe you have been in Israel during a terrible storm. I have, and it was terrible, terrible. But they could not get in. And they were being hit by lightning, <laughs> these guys. And they had no place even to sleep. They, there was no trees around there. The Romans had gotten trees the first time they came down. And so they're madder than snakes. And they finally get in the door the next day. Some had died in the earthquake that split the place into three. And they went down in the hole. And so they came into Jerusalem and people were thinking, these guys are going to save us. But they got back to their Jew-hating portion of the Idumean heart and they killed 1,500 people when they went in there. Those in the lower city, just poor people. While the zealots hid out in the temple and in fortified places. Okay, here's case study number five. Revelation 11, 7 through 13. I got about 15 minutes. If you could stay awake. 11, 7. And when they finished their testimony, this is speaking of the two witnesses, the beast. The one coming up out of the abyss will wage war with them and will beat them and kill them. And their corpses will be on the boulevard of the great city that's called Sodom and Egypt in a spiritual sense, where their master was also staked. And they'll look all those out of the peoples and tribes and languages and cultures to their, to their corpses for three days and a half. 
and they'll not allow their corpses to be laid into a memorial tomb. And those residing on the land will rejoice and celebrate on them. And they'll send gifts one to another because these two prophets terrorized all those residing on the land. Everybody wants to know where they are. Well, we'll, we'll venture a couple guesses here. We had another session on this before, and I mentioned that I thought that these witnesses would certainly, one of them would be Jesus, Jesus, son of Ananias, the one crying, woe, woe, woe. Josephus says, woe, woe, woe. The Revelation says, woe, woe. There are three woes. Josephus talks about stones on fire coming down out of the air. And that's what happened in Revelation 2. Some stuff's coming down out of the air. Jesus, son of Ananias, after seven years of prophesying, is hit with one of these stones. And I don't think that Revelation tells us how Jesus ben Ananias died. You would think that they would have power over him and then tear him to pieces. But all oh, that story of Yahshua ben Ananias is such a sad one. I feel so bad about him. And I feel that he's one of them. All he had to do is have a partner, an obscure prophet. They were just more than 12 prophets in Israel, even at this time. It's because we don't know the name doesn't mean that they didn't live. After three and a half days, a breath of life out of the Elohim entered into them, and they stood up on their feet. Verse 11. And great fear fell on those watching them, and they heard a loud voice saying to them out of the sky, Come up here! And they went up into the sky in a cloud. Is this another rapture? This is the fourth one we've come across, if it is. And if it is, then that doesn't mean that it all happened at one time or that it only is going to happen once. Come up here. And they went up into the sky in the cloud again. And their enemy saw them there. And in that hour, there came to be a great quake. And the tenth of the city fell. And 7,000 names of men were killed in the quake. And the remainder came to be terrified and rendered respect to Elohim of the sky. The second woe is past, behold. The third woe, woe, woe comes. I've heard people say, oh, there was no quake at that time. There wasn't a quake at that time. There wasn't a storm at that time. Well, how the hell do you know? Really? All we have is one account of this. And certainly, if Josephus had the opportunity in time, there wouldn't be enough books in the whole world to fill up the story of the sack of Jerusalem. Anyway, this vision is also part of the sixth trumpet. It appears before the second trumpet sounds anyway. It's the first passage in Revelation where the beast, the Therion, is mentioned. And it's also where the great city is first mentioned and defined as being the city where Yeshua was staked. That is Jerusalem. Josephus described a morning in February 68. When the city of Jerusalem woke up to find that 8,500 people had died during the night due to an earthquake. Yes, an earthquake did happen. And a slaughter carried out by the Idumeans. 
And here's how he described the earthquake in the midst of a great storm. For there broke out a prodigious storm in the night. I'm sorry, but I got to break in and say, I've had so many people come against me on this. Oh, there was no earthquake at this time. The weatherman told me so. For there broke out a prodigious storm in the night, and with the utmost violence and very strong winds, and the largest showers of rain with continued lightnings, terrible thunderings, and amazing concussions and bellowings of the earth that was in an earthquake. Anyone would guess that these wonders foreshadowed some grand calamities that were coming. And here's how he, he described the slaughter carried out by the Idumeans that same night, those same Idumeans that came to fortify Jerusalem after they managed to saw through the gates and break into the city. They should have just been able to come up and go in. This calamity wouldn't have happened. Do you think Elohim shut that gigantic door so they couldn't come in? Here's the story. The zealots also joined in the shouts raised by the Idumeans, and the storm itself rendered the cry more terrible. Nor did the Idumeans spare anybody, for as they are naturally a most barbarous and bloody nation, and had been distressed by the tempest, they made use of their weapons against those that had shut the gates against them. Now, there was at present neither any place for flight nor any hope of preservation. But as they were driven one upon another in heaps, so were they slain. And now the outer temple was all of it and overflowed with blood. And that day, as it came on, they saw 8,500 dead bodies there. Recall that John said, in the earthquake, 7,000 men were killed. Josephus didn't distinguish between how many died in the earthquake and how many were killed by the sword. But it's possible that the earthquake killed 7,000 and the Idumeans killed 1,500. But understand the number seven is just enough that you need. 7,000 is not meant usually to be a literal number. When you see seven or three or 100 or 1,000, it's neither an exaggeration or promotes less. It is just means a big number, the complete amount. The next day, the Idumeans, working on behalf of the Zealots, hunted down and killed a couple of former high priests. Listen to this. Ananus II and Yeshua. This, in this case, it's Yeshua ben Domnius. And in Josephus, there are a plethora of Yeshua's. These two who had long tormented the zealots by opposing their war and working for peace. Here's how Josephus described their deaths in Wars 5-2. The Idumeans sought for the high priest and went with greatest zeal against them, and as soon as they caught them, they slew them. And then standing upon their dead bodies, in a way of joking, upbraided Ananus with his kindness to the people, and Yahshua with his speech made to them from the wall. Nay, they proceeded to that degree of impiety as to cast away their dead bodies without burial. Burial. I should not mistake if I said that the death of Ananus was the beginning of the destruction of the city. He preferred peace above all things. Peace for everyone but James the Just, that is. He was a shrewd man in speaking and persuading the people and had already gotten the mastery of those that opposed his designs or were for the war. And this at last was the end of Ananus and Yahshua. I'm going to close with this, this uh, word, last paragraph. 
So both Yochanan and Josephus described two individuals in Jerusalem who were hated and killed and not allowed to be buried. That's just too much to be a coincidence. If we go back to Revelation 11, 5 through 6, they also both describe a couple of men who could be could not be taken down by their enemies until this particular time. And it described this happening at the same time as an earthquake that coincided with the deaths of at least 7,000 people. Both of these guys, that's why I have put that little paragraph in red. And thus the two witnesses, according to Josephus, were Ananus and Yahshua Damaeus. And although Ananus lost the priesthood for the execution of James, these two priests were certainly the most prominent witnesses against the zealots' plan for war. And I guess if Elohim was going to be against anybody, he would have to be the zealots. And they were called zealots because they were zealous for the Torah. But evidently, it was a Torah that didn't include right to life, that didn't include the prohibition on murder or theft. They were all banditos. And this conclusion is also very close to fitting the mold of prophecy from Zechariah 2 through 6, especially 4 and 6, in which Yahashua and Zerubbabel were held up as very holy rule, rulers, the sons of oil, in Zechariah 4 and 6. And I leave it at that, hoping that you'll go out and take a look at Zechariah 4, 8, and following. And then, is that 6 there? Oh, just read 4, 8 through six. See how much of mark the amount that this has in common with both the Revelation story and Josephus' account. It's absolutely amazing. Amazing. And you'll also learn in, if you want to go a little farther and go to chapter three and start there instead, you'll find some secret knowledge about this Yehoshua that when I first read it years ago, I could have fallen off the chair. Actually, that was Zechariah 3, 3. Actually, uh, Zechariah 3, 1 through about the first eight verses. And so we have these people in Revelation 11, two witnesses. We have the two of these people mentioned that should be, they should be candidates instead of dragging someone out of heaven like Moses or Elijah or Enoch or who else, who knows. They should be contemporaneous people. Everybody else that is marked out as a person there is a contemporaneous person. Anyway, this particular case is probably the most controversial of all. It deserves deeper study. You know, the futurists are going to say, oh, no, it's Moses and Elijah. They're going to say it just like that, as though you were a heretic. My friend, who we worked with for 10 years there in uh, New Earth Restoration, just went nuts when I mentioned this. Can't you open your mind a little bit? Can't you consider it? Especially since Josephus is the only eyewitness testimony we have to this. And he was a holy man. He was a priest. He's not a big fat liar. He had a hard time in life. Consider 
where he is with the people he loves, the Jews, he can't even go back there. He has to leave. He cannot go back. They will kill him. And he's got assassins after him in Rome. He's got to go hiding out. I wonder if he had any self-doubt. And I'll tell you something else. I feel in my spirit that this guy was a believer. He became a believer because at the end of the century, all kinds of people in the royal groups, the imperial host, including the members of the Emperor Domitian's own family, Vespasian, Titus, Clement, Epaphroditus, if I could think of them, I'd mention a few more, were brought up on charges of being proponents of a false religion or a foreign superstition and executed. Right at the same time, he disappears. And so does Clement, and so does uh, Epaphroditus, and a few more that I know of, I can't think of right now. They all disappear, and they're all marked up in Roman history as being executed for foreign superstition. All right, thank you for sitting so quietly. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to wake you up. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and um, Slavonic, Slavonic version, if I ever get it finished, I still have about 150 pages. Um, I'd sure like to let that go and let people read that, people that are really interested, because there's so much more in there. Okay, my friends, thank you again for making me feel like my life is worth something other than just sitting here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Abundantly so. Abundantly so it's worth, worth it. All right. Marcio, I'm going to send you a quick email tonight if I didn't already. Got something I need to share with you. Bye-bye.